So as we as we get started here, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about um, about these two men. And in, in, I know we're focused on 1943 this weekend, but uh, December of 1941 was the month that the United States is pushed into the war. It's the month that both of these men were pushed into the war. Uh, in your book here, you write about Nimitz arriving in Pearl Harbor in the wake of the attack on the Pacific Fleet there. Um, who was Nimitz as he's arriving in Pearl Harbor? What led to his arrival yeah. there taking command for the, the United States? Yeah, great question, actually, because Nimitz was not somebody who was flashy or flamboyant. He was not the first one to be named as someone who would lead a fleet into battle. Uh, he had spent two consecutive tours as what was then called the Chief of the Bureau of Navigation. Now, today we call it the Chief of Naval Personnel. Name change, same job. But as chief of the bureau, what his job was, was to track the careers of every officer in the Navy. So he knew these people all by name and by record and by experience and by reputation, if not by personal interaction. But the other thing that he knew was that he knew the president. Franklin Roosevelt was a guy who thought of himself as a Navy man. He had learned to sail a boat by the time he was six on the Hudson River, uh, almost before he could walk. It's a bit of an exaggeration, but not a lot. Uh, and he had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I under uh, Woodrow Wilson and really believed the Navy was a particular interest of his. Um, I remember a story in particular one time when the Bureau sent the names of those picked to become uh, rear admirals in the Navy, to be fleeted up from captain to rear admiral, a big step, obviously, in any naval officer's career. And Roosevelt was running his name down the list, and his finger stopped. And he said, wait a minute. What is, I don't even know this guy. As if the president would know every single candidate to be nominated for rear admiral. But Roosevelt did. And because of that, he and Nimitz had the kind of relationship where the phone would ring in Nimitz's quarters late at night and Frank would ask for Chester. So they had that kind of relationship. And in fact, Roosevelt wanted Nimitz to become Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet a year before Pearl Harbor. You think about what history would have been had that happened. And Nimitz turned it down. He said, Mr. President, I can't accept that. I'm much too junior. There are 50 admirals senior to me. The resentment would be much too great. You need to pick someone else. And he did. He picked husband Kimmel, who is the guy who, for better or for worse, and everybody in here is going to have an opinion about that, uh, accepted the opprobrium for the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Had that been Chester Nimitz, he might well have been shelved in the same way that Kimmel was after the Japanese attack, but he wasn't. And so on almost the day after that attack, I've been trying to track this story down, and I haven't found it chapter and verse, but everybody tells it, so I will too. And that is that Roosevelt called Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy, into his office and said, all right, this time, tell Chester to get out to Pearl Harbor and don't come back till the war is won. Now, whether he actually said that or not, I don't know. But the sentiment, I think, is historically accurate. Roosevelt knew this was the guy that he needed. He had the temperament uh, to pull this thing together after the trauma of that Japanese attack. And so that's why he wanted Nimitz there. And Nimitz arrived there on Christmas Day of 1941 uh, and, and took over the command on New Year's Eve. So it was kind of a holiday experience, I guess. So he, he took over a fleet that had already been devastated at literally the worst moment it possibly could be. Let's, let's talk a little bit about their personalities here, Nimitz, Nimitz and Eisenhower. Um, what, were, what were they like as, as people? Yeah, um, I think it's fairly easy to, to divide uh, great military leaders in any war, but particularly perhaps World War II, into the, uh, uh, the show ponies and the workhorses. You probably have your own opinions about who these people might be. I can name a few show ponies. We may get into them later in the conversation today. But Eisenhower and Nimitz were workhorses. Um, and look at the things they had in common. By the way, they're both born in Texas. Did you know that? 300 miles apart. 
Eisenhower from the little town of Denison, just north of Dallas, and Nimitz from the little town of Fredericksburg, just north of San Antonio. Now, Eisenhower only lived there for a couple of years and always considered Abilene, Kansas his home, and I think that's a fair assessment. But they were also both of Germanic descent. Now, the Eisenhowers had come to America sooner in the 18th century, 1740s, 1750s, uh, Nimitz's grandparents were German. There was German spoke in the home. So they had that in common. Here's another curious thing most people don't know about them, is that Eisenhower originally was encouraged to apply for a service academy to get a free education. He and his brother both wanted to go to college. They, they came up with a scheme where they would each work a year and the other went to college and they'd switch and that really wasn't working out very well. And then he learned that you could get a free education, courtesy of Uncle Sam, if you went to a service academy, and he wanted to go to Annapolis. <laughs> Nimitz was at a fair in Texas, and he saw a, 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 an artillery group putting on a demonstration at the fair, and they were dressed up in their West Point uniforms. Boy, did they look sharp. And he wanted to go to West Point. And they each applied to their congressman, and each of them were told, I'm sorry, that bill has been filled, but I got one at this other place. <laughs> and that's how one ended up a general and one ended up an admiral. But I think the thing that links them more, most closely is the key word, and that's temperament. They were able to deal with difficult people. And think of the difficult people they dealt with. I mean, in the case of Nimitz, Ernie King was his boss. A tough, known nonsense. His daughter said he shaved with a blowtorch. Uh, <laughs> tough guy. And of course, uh, Eisenhower had been an aide to Douglas MacArthur. We were talking about show ponies earlier. So. <laughs> and also had to deal with uh, Monty Montgomery, and for that matter, Winston Churchill. And, oh, let's not forget George Patton. And Nimitz had to work with people with nicknames like uh, Howling Mad Smith, Bull Halsey, Terrible Turner. The ability to take people like that, unquestionably talented, but of disparate personalities and hard charging, and make them all pull in the same direction on the same rope. That's a skill that requires personnel management that has nothing to do with taking the bit in your teeth and saying, do it because I tell you. Each of these guys was able to coordinate this disparate group into a team that could get things done. And, and that's a rare enough, but especially rare to have two guys in command of theaters on opposite sides of the world with very similar temperaments. Well, since, uh, since one of these figures uh, was just mentioned, let's talk a little bit more about him. Um, one of the things that uh, struck me from, from the book was that Nimitz had two pictures on his desk. Uh, Frank. <laughs> he did. Uh, Frank, as you mentioned, President Roosevelt, and the other was? Douglas MacArthur. Um, so how did, how did he, how did he well, relate Well, that's him? interesting. We don't know for sure, but here's what I think. Uh, and that is that the picture, the photograph of Roosevelt was a studio portrait that Roosevelt sent him. It says, to my good friend Chester from your old pal Frank. What a, what a politician that man was, right? So he kept that on his desk. The other one was not a studio photograph. It was cut out of a magazine. In other words, MacArthur didn't send this to Nimitz. Nimitz went out, found a photograph, clipped it out, put it in a frame, and put, him on, put it on his desk. Why? That's a great question. Um, one of his aides, well, one of his aides uh, thought, his opinion, not Nimitz's opinion, but thought that it was a cautionary note. Don't be like that guy. Uh, he attributed to Nimitz the phrase, it reminds me not to hurl Jovian thunderbolts. Now again, I've not been able to track down the origin of that quotation. It's again, credible. Um, but I think it was just to remind Nimitz that he wasn't in charge of everything. He had to deal with a boss and a partner. In theory, Nimitz and uh, MacArthur each commanded a theater in the Pacific. They were co-equals. <laughs> if you did a wire diagram of who's in charge of what, they're on the same level, just different geographical areas. 
Now, Nimitz's was 11 times bigger than MacArthur's, but it was mostly water. And of course, a MacArthur thought this was absolutely absurd. When Nimitz was a commander in the Navy, MacArthur was chief of staff of the Army. I mean, and now they're on the same level in the wire diagram? That's just not right. And of course, MacArthur was also MacArthur, very difficult to deal with. And he, this goes back, I think, to the two of them together in terms of temperament. Imagine being his aide, which Eisenhower was, and having to say, yes, sir, general, and no one called him anything but general. Even his wife, by the way, <laughs> called him general. Um, yes, sir, general, and, and but have you considered this? I mean, that's the kind of thing an aide is supposed to do, or a chief of staff, um, but it's hard to do. Of course I've considered that, and I've made my decision. Um, here's, here's a story that tells you a lot about each man. In this case, I'm talking about MacArthur and Eisenhower. And that is when the Philippines were falling apart, and it was clear the Japanese were going to occupy them in 1942. The president of the Philippines raided the gold reserves of the country and offered MacArthur, I've forgotten the number, I'm going to make one up now, $842,000, which in today's money would be about $28 million, and offered a somewhat smaller but nevertheless munificent sum to Eisenhower. MacArthur took it. Eisenhower turned it down. Maybe all you need to know. But the fact that Eisenhower could deal with MacArthur, and then of course subsequently deal with all the other difficult personalities, uh, shows you a lot about who they were. And of course Nimitz had to deal with MacArthur on a different level. Um, MacArthur and, and Eisenhower were never in the same chain of command during World War II, because MacArthur commanded a theater and Eisenhower commanded a theater, but different theaters on opposite sides of the world. Mac uh, Nimitz and MacArthur were cheek by jowl in the Pacific, and a lot of the things they undertook had to be done in cooperation. So Nimitz had to very carefully assess and judge what he could ask of MacArthur, what he could offer MacArthur, how much he had to play up to MacArthur to get the things he needed to be done. But I think each of them demonstrated that they could maintain their integrity and keep the war moving forward while dealing with an unquestionably brilliant, but nevertheless very difficult man. So with keeping that war moving forward and, and working with, with MacArthur, uh, obviously Midway, the major, major victory of 1942, uh, early 1943, what are these major strategic challenges that, that Nimitz is facing in the Pacific? You have Eisenhower in North Africa yeah. uh, learning that sometimes you have to have defeats, work through commanders, figure out how to fight together as an army, right. figure out how to have victory. What are the lessons that, that Nimitz is facing in early 43? <clears throat> well, again, I think a comparison is very useful here. 42 is the year when we're not really sure this is going to work out. I mean, the Germans are winning the Battle of the Atlantic. The Japanese are gobbling up most of the Western Pacific. Uh, the Germans are still driving toward Moscow. We know now, after the fact, that they had suffered some reverses, but they moved south into the Caucasus. I mean, things looked bad in 1942. 43 is the year that turns around. So each of them are now in a position to begin at least thinking about planning going on the offensive, taking the initiative, taking the war to the enemy. Um, an example of that is that in mid-1943, the first Essex-class aircraft carriers arrived in Pearl Harbor. At the beginning of the year, in the very end of 1942 and into 1943, the army that Eisenhower commands is moving across North Africa and preparing to, preparing to leap across the Sicilian Narrows into Sicily. So they're each now looking at offensive possibilities, but the, the material buildup, you mentioned in your introduction, it's not just manpower and materiel, but a lot of it is. The material that American industry was producing was just beginning to get to the front lines. The landing craft, the tanks, the airplanes, all those tools each of them would need to make the offensive a success. And if you want to look at, at the trajectory of 1943 for, let's start with Eisenhower, it begins with Kasserine Pass in February 1943 which reveals to the world, and shockingly to ourselves, 
that our army isn't really quite ready to take on the Germans nose to nose. We, we get it handed to us at Kasserine Pass. And of course, the British reaction is, well, you see, I, we've been telling you, you know. <laughs> um, but that was a wake-up call. But the year ends with the conquest of Sicily, the landings in Salerno, moving up in the fall of Rome on Christmas 1943. So that trajectory from Kasserine Pass to the fall of Rome shows that momentum. The war is turned. Uh, we're, we're just getting into the position of being able to seize and hold the initiative. And the same is true in the Pacific. Now the difficulty for Nimitz in the Pacific is he's really not entirely in charge because the Pacific has been divided into two theaters. MacArthur's is the southwest Pacific and he's moving up along the north coast of New Guinea looking to the Philippines and Nimitz is looking first along the Solomon Islands and then the central Pacific heading for Japan itself. And they each need the same stuff. More airplanes, more transport shipping, more amphibious ships. The same thing is kind of true for Eisenhower. You know, when he puts together a plan, well, his planning team puts together a plan for the invasion of Sicily, Montgomery walks into the room and says, this is, this is all crap. Throw, it's a dog's breakfast. Throw it out. If you use your plan, it will fail. If you use my plan, we will succeed. So Eisenhower's got to deal with that in the same way that Nimitz has to deal with MacArthur. Who's going to get the resources? Who's going to get the supplies? Let's work this out. Let's figure it out. So again, it's managing war, but it's also managing people. And that's what's going on in 1943. I, I know uh, Susan is, uh, Eisenhower um, has told the story quite often about um, Ike's belief in the importance of leadership is dealing with people, it's managing emotions. He wrote to the uh, superintendent of West Point in 1946 when he was chief of staff of the Army, suggesting a psychology department. Mm. Um, so Nimitz clearly thought the same thing. Managing emotions is, is key to managing people. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I think they both, and I'm not sure whether either of them, I mean, the idea of the psychology course is a good one. Um, I'm not sure that either of them ever sat down and made a list of rules. Well, a good leader should do A, B, C, D. I think it was more a, a, a feeling, an instinct, that they understood people and therefore could deal. They had, here's another word besides temperament, empathy. They could look at a problem the way this junior officer or this competitor or somebody, they could look at the way they looked at that problem and deal with it in, in terms that person could appreciate and understand. Uh, one of the things both of them were good at was listening. We think leaders take charge and they proclaim, but really good leaders listen first. Um, people would come into Nimitz's office and they would begin to explain something, and Nimitz would just keep quiet. And, and the way his aide finally figured this out, the way you knew when Nimitz had heard enough is he'd start moving pencils around on his desk. And he'd go, oh, okay, I'm done. But General, uh, Admiral, what do you think? Uh, so the ability to, to deal with people with your temperament, the ability to have empathy and see things the way they did, and the ability to listen to them so you understood what their point of view was. On, on the subject of empathy, um, late 1943, Tarawa, Major, major battle, you have um, thousands of casualties, it has this major impact here in the United States. Nimitz greenlit releasing uh, footage of, of the battlefield and he visited Tarawa shortly afterwards. Uh, you write about Nimitz receiving letters from, mm -hmm. from next of kin. How did that impact him? Well, every commander who has to send young men into harm's way, and today young women as well, um, if you're a, a good commander, you feel that. And both of these guys did. Uh, I think it, I, it, hard to sleep at night under those circumstances. But in a way, Tarawa was for the Navy in the Pacific what Kasserine Pass was for the Army in North Africa. It was a wake-up call. It showed the enemy was really good. One of the things that they say is almost a cliche at the Naval War College. We were talking about the War College earlier. 
um, is the enemy gets a vote. You know, you make plans, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to go here, we're going to go there, but the enemy gets a vote. And when you bump up against that and you see that, it's jarring. You still have to make the sacrifice. The sacri wars are costly, and not just in money. Uh, but it was really hard for Nimitz. He would get the letter. When they first came in, his aide, Hal Lamar, would pass them up to the, because the admiral said, I want to see him. And uh, after a while, he just, he just wouldn't do it anymore. He would just file them away, because there were so many. And they would, dear Admiral Nimitz, you killed my son at Tarawa. I hope you never sleep again for the rest of your life. Well, he would answer the letters. Dear Mrs. Smith, I'm terribly distraught at your loss. I, hardly imaginable to me how terrible that must be, and so on and so on. Um, but after a while, the aide just finally stopped forwarding them up the line. But I think that, that goes with the territory. How about how each man related to subordinates? Mm. Um, certainly, you write about Nimitz having a number of very special relationships, including uh, Raymond Spruance. I think something about good leaders and how they relate to those under their command. Yeah, well, the relationship between Nimitz and Spruance is a very special one. They were almost identical, peas in a pod. Uh, the biography that Tom Buell wrote about uh, Raymond Spruance is called The Quiet Warrior. I could have used that one, right? I mean, The Quiet Warrior. I mean, he, he was an instinctive warrior. Winning the war was the most important thing. But he didn't grandstand it. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't shout at anybody. None of that stuff. You don't see it with Nimitz either. Here's the other thing they had in common is they were physical fitness maniacs. Uh, Nimitz's father died before he was born. He was raised by his paternal grandfather on a hill country farm out in Texas. Um, so he never knew his father. But his father was something like 28, 29 years old when he died. Heart attack. Killed him. And so Nimitz, I am, that is not happening to me. I'm working out every day. And he did. He would go on these uh, Herculean walks, you know, seven, eight miles. And I, you know, power walking, we would call it today. One of his activities was he'd go to the beach. And when he first asked, hey, anybody want to, ready to go to the beach? Hey, yeah. yeah. And off they go to the beach. Well, here's what that meant. You swim straight out to sea for half a mile. Then you turn 90 degrees and you swim along the shore in deep water for two miles. Then you turn into the shore and then you hike back in the sand. Well, after his staff figured out what that going to the beach meant, he would send his aide around to say, the Admiral was ready to go to the beach. And he'd take her and they'd dive under their desks. But Spruance... Spruance was all in. I mean, they'd swim out half a mile, they'd turn 90 degrees and start swimming, and Nimitz would turn in toward the shore. N Spruance kept going. And uh, when he was on a ship, he would walk around the ship, walk and walk and walk. He didn't even have a chair in his office. He had a standing desk, big thing now, but unique then. And he, he worked on his feet all day long. So they had that in common too. So there was kind of a special bond between those two. But more broadly in your question, I think the key to understanding and leading your subordinates effectively is first of understand where they are, and we're back to the empathy thing again. One of the things he did, and he in this case being Nimitz, was that he required every CO who put in at Pearl Harbor, and let's not kid ourselves, that's every CO who went to the Pacific at some point here in Pearl Harbor, to come in and say hello. So he would know who they were. He'd make little notes and so know who they are. And that included the junior officers. Lieutenants, lieutenants junior grade would come in and he'd sit down with them and talk to them and he'd say, boy, you're in a great spot, a young destroyer commander out there. You're going to go far. I can tell. You're going to be one of the good ones. And that, that kid, kid, 28-year-old man would go out and just feel like a million bucks. And Eisenhower could do that too. Uh, you, one of the pictures you may show later is the one famous one. Many of us have seen it where Eisenhower is talking to the group of airborne personnel are about to go into France. Mm -hmm. And he's leaning in and he's got his hand like this and he's, he's telling these young men, and it's often been interpreted as, look at him inspiring these young men to go in and sacrifice their all for democracy and freedom. Susan Eisenhower is the one who told me this story. You may have heard it. What he would do is he'd go up and say, where are you from? 
and he would try to make a connection. In this case, it was the guy happened to be from Michigan. And Eisenhower said, Michigan, oh, they have great fly fishing in Michigan. But here's the thing about fly fishing. You've got to keep your thumb on the reel <laughs> like this so you can feel it when the fish hits. Yeah. Did she tell that story here last See? She did. She, See? Did. See? she told it to me, too, yeah. Well, on, on that subject of, um, you know, 44 and the broader war, um, how did, those, how did these events of, of 80 years ago in 1943 prepare them for these final tasks of, uh, not final tasks, we should say, but uh, these larger tasks of in, invading Western Europe and, and the push to, into the Marianas and, and the, the drive closer to Japan in the Pacific? Yeah, well, 43 is the year we seize the initiative. We go on the offensive. The Japanese are back on their heels a little bit. 44 is the critical year for, as you mentioned, winning the war. And... What's needed to do that is, is the shipping, the transportation, because it's a global war. You've got to get the men to Britain. You've got to get them across the channel. And then you've got to keep them there supplied with food, ammunition, blood plasma, and because it's an American army, Hershey bars and newspapers and mail from home. And all of that requires sea transport. Well, the same thing is true in the Pacific. And remember, the Pacific is two theaters, MacArthur's and Nimitz. So everybody wants the same things. There are three different competitors. And of course, Churchill doesn't let go of the idea of fighting in the Mediterranean until the very last minute. So in a way, there's four theaters. And they each want the same things. They want transport ships. And in particular, they want amphibious ships, LSTs, landing ships tank. You can't conduct an amphibious landing without LSTs. And that's the bottleneck in the whole war, building enough LSTs so that you can begin and sustain all these simultaneous events, offensives. Keep in mind, D-Day, the biggest invasion in the history of organized warfare, takes place one week before the invasion of Saipan, the second biggest invasion up to that time in the history of organized warfare. Okinawa would surpass it, but these take place 10 days apart on opposite sides of the world, all using the same kinds of ships. So that competition pitted these guys, kind of, plus MacArthur, plus Churchill, all against one another. So that's, that's really the key problem in 1944. Where does the material go and how do you divide it up? Well, it's, you know, referencing these guys, this fantastic picture here, uh, enjoying mint juleps together in uh, 1946. I couldn't find a great 43 Eichen in uh, Nimitz photo, but wanted to share just one or two other pictures of the oh, two of them uh, from our friends at the Presidential Library in Abilene, okay. Kansas. So here we have Eichen Nimitz. Uh, this is uh, planning the Armed Forces Benefit Game in Washington. Was Nimitz a big football fan? Oh, uh, Everybody at the Naval Academy is a football fan on the yeah. first Saturday in December. Uh, so, yeah, to that extent it is. I mean, the yeah. whole brigade, called a regiment then, the brigade now would turn out for the games, and, and it, was, it was a big deal. You know, nowadays it's very sweet because who sings last is what matters. You know, the losing team sings their alma mater, and then the winning team sings. And each team goes to stand behind and respect for the other, but I, I was, I'm working on the class of 1940, and in 1938, during the Army-Navy game, uh, the Army guys won the game and ran over the Navy side and sang, good night ladies, instead. So that, <laughs> so yeah, everybody was a football fan, and I'm sure there was teasing and back and forth, but here they are in, uh, already wearing five stars, so this is, this is fairly late in the war. By the way, trick question, trivia question, who was senior? They each wear five stars. Fleet Admiral, General of the Army. But who's senior? Anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> Nimitz was senior by one day. That's the way they wrote it. Uh, they went Army, Navy, Army, Navy. And Mar George Marshall was first. And then uh, <laughs> Leahy, the Admiral's aide, and then they went to MacArthur, and then they went to Nimitz, and then they went to Eisenhower. So I, they're all one day apart, in case there's any, any arguments. 
But Nimitz was one day senior. And it's interesting because he was 10 years, no, five years older and 10 years senior in terms of graduation date from the academy. You know, Nimitz was class of 05, 1905. Eisenhower was the class of 1915 because he'd gone to work. He and his brother had this thing. Remember, they were going to put each other through school and didn't go to West Point until 25. And the reason he didn't go to the Naval Academy was not only because the billet was filled, he was too old. You couldn't be 25 and go to the Naval Academy. Nimitz went when he was 17 to the Naval Academy. But uh, Eisenhower went and was in the class of 1915. And what's special about the class of 1915? It's the class the stars fell on. 61 members of the class became general officers. 36% of the entire class became general officers. And what that tells you is, yes, it matters a lot whether you're competent and effective and temp have the right temperament and empathetic, but it also matters when you're born. Because yeah. all these guys were lieutenant colonels in 1940, and therefore they all became generals by 1945. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. No, nope. yeah. timing is timing is timing is, crucial, is right? a lot. Next up, we have Ike and Nimitz receiving uh, honorary degrees, Doctor of Laws in Richmond. This is March 28th of 1946, mm -hmm. Richmond, Virginia. And uh, afterwards, oh, well, oh, I'm one ahead of myself. This is Nimitz visiting. Gettysburg National Military right, Park, right. August. You recognize the statue, of course. August of 1946. Uh, a couple months earlier, Eisenhower spoke as the commencement speaker at Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg College. So uh, something else they had in common. They both came through town here the year after World War II. So this is them with Parker. Is that you, Dan, right there? Uh, the yeah. Is if, that you? If, then... if you squint and turn your head a little bit and I okay. shave the beard, then maybe. But. Uh, Park historian Frederick Tilburg, that's them at the okay. North Carolina Memorial here right. out on the battlefield from the archives here of uh, Gettysburg National Military Park. But uh, after, after that honorary doctor of laws, it appears that's when this picture was taken in the, uh. the, at the home of Douglas Southall Freeman, a good friend of both. Yeah, yeah. Both had they a were love both of big history. fans, yeah. big fans. I mean, uh, one of the things we know about uh, Nimitz was that he brought the set of uh, uh, R.E. Lee and Lee's lieutenants with him to Hawaii, and it was important to him uh, to read those. And he really wanted Freeman to be to come to Hawaii. He was really hoping there was a delegation that was coming out, and he he really asked if Douglas Southall Freeman could be part of that and mm. come here. So he was a very serious student of the war. In in the Eisenhower home, there's over 900 books on display, which. Uh, I ask students before they visit the house, what's the one item you're going to see more than any other? And afterwards, they'll say books. We talk about his love of reading. Um, an original seven volumes of uh, Freeman's Washington biography signed, signed to Eisenhower, mm -hmm. one of my favorite things that we have. But they, they, all, they both had this deep love of history. Um, obviously, Eisenhower living here in retirement. Um, Nimitz reading about the Civil War. Uh, I, I think that shaped them as well, this love of history, shaped who they were as leaders. I think it did. Um, I reread uh, Freeman when I was working on this because I read that Nimitz would kept that by his bed. Uh, and I came across a line I quoted in the book where uh, one of the things that uh, Freeman thinks made Lee a weaker general was that he wouldn't confront people. He would kind of sidle them off to the side. He'd work around them. And of course, that's exactly what Nimitz did, too. It's one of the ways <laughs> in which Ernie King, who was Nimitz's boss, Chief of Naval Operations, Ernest J. King, thought that Nimitz didn't quite live up to what he wanted. He wanted Nimitz to be tough. I hope I can say this in this audience. He, King made it very clear to Nimitz that if you want to be successful, you've got to be a son of a bitch. If you're not a son of a bitch, you'll never make it. And he didn't think Nimitz was enough of a son of a bitch. Hmm. Neither was Robert E. Lee, by the way. <laughs> well, clearly, clearly Nimitz did make it. Apparently. Uh, right, d despite that. Um, what about the, the personal relationship uh, between these two men? We've had a few, few photographs. What was their, their personal relationship like? Any, any great anecdotes of, 
of their, their interactions, perhaps? You know, it, it, they probably never, we're talking about 1943, they probably never saw each other during the entire calendar year of 1943. They're on opposite sides of the world. They're managing different wars, wars that require the same kinds of assets and support, to be sure, but with very different problems and very different subordinates and very different uh, strategic uh, difficulties. Uh, now, afterward, we see all of these photographs when they're wearing five stars. After the war, when uh, they each move on to other things, uh, Nimitz becomes chief of naval operations for a two-year term. Eisenhower, of course, uh, becomes chairman of the, joint of the uh, Army Chief of Staff and then president of Columbia University. And people recognizing that there is a symbiotic relationship here often created opportunities for them to be together, but they were not really pals in any way. Um, so, so the short answer to that question is no. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's, let's think about, there's a, there's a phrase you use um, at, at the end of your book, Nimitz at War, about Nimitz being a force multiplier. Yeah. Explain a bit about what that means, because I think, again, in keeping with our theme here, that's something we could say about both men in the war and their effectiveness. I think those who worked with Nimitz and those who worked with Eisenhower recognized instinctively that they became better, more effective officers because of the kind of support that their boss gave them. Uh, and that's, if we're going to go back to MacArthur, that's certainly less true of MacArthur. I, he's almost a forced negator. He had wonderful subordinates. Kruger and Eigelberger were great generals, and every time they got their name in the newspapers, MacArthur would slap them down. But the people who worked for Eisenhower and Nimitz knew that he had their back, he would support them, uh, he gave them what they needed, he listened to them. Uh, if they said this needs to be delayed, he said, we can do that. If he knew it couldn't be delayed, he'd explain to them why it could not, and you'll just have to make the best with what you've got. But let me tell you why. Uh, and that's why I use the phrase force multiplier. Each of those subordinates who worked for them, both Eisenhower and Nimitz, became better commanders, more effective commanders, because of the support that they had behind them uh, and next to them, and they knew they could count on it. I, I was asked before our, our conversation tonight to ask you about something in particular about Nimitz. Uh-oh. His, his, his dental health. Oh, yeah. Yeah, is he smiling? That's the most biggest smile you're ever going to see from Chester Nimitz. You look at his pictures, uh, he looks very grim-faced. A lot of people who saw him only in his photographs thought, well, that's a serious person. He's always got his mouth closed. Um, and I wondered about this. I actually, one of the many people who helped me with this book were his twin grandsons, um, Chet and Dick. And Chet, they're not identical twins, they're fraternal twins. Um, but Chet looks just like him. But in any case, I, I worked with both of them and they sent me family pictures and material. One of the things they sent me was his dental record. <laughs> and I put it in the book and, and I expressed it. I can't do the numbers, but I'll come close to it. What the dental record from 1941 says is that the following teeth, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, 14, 15, 17, 18, 19, 23, 24, 25, 31, 32, are missing. <laughs> um, and 